Thank you very much for that great startup grind. Welcome. Uh, we're, we're here with Robert Antoniatis. You currently serve on the boards of Infobright Software, Adaptive Insights, Brickstream, and Igloo Software. Previously, you served on boards like Verifin, Vericent, which was acquired by IBM, and ITM Software, which was acquired by BMC, and Placemark, acquired by Investnet. So there's a lot of uh, success stories there. And uh, because working hard just isn't enough in life, Robert's also the past chair of the Distress Centers of Toronto, current chair of Flemington, uh, Flemington Neighborhood Services, and the chair and co-founder of the Upside Foundation of Canada. He's got a BBA from Wilfrid Laurier University. He's a chartered financial analyst, a fellow of the Canadian Securities Institute, and a certified investment manager. The interesting thing is that after working for a bank for 10 years, uh, Robert uh, uh, last fall joined at, uh, or took, took a sort of an exit and he took part of the bank with him. He and his partner David Unsworth uh, spun out uh, from Royal Bank to, to, to form Information Venture Partners and I think you took the portfolio with you. So I think it was a sort of a divestment or something. Can you explain what that was all about? We bought a block, stock and barrel. So we bought the bank? No, we bought the, we bought the portfolio. <laughs> He had the opportunity, and we were quite fortunate uh, because of the regulatory changes in the banking environment that venture capital is no longer an interesting business to banks. Uh, they, they really can't participate in it, um, and so we took advantage of that and the willingness of the bank to sell us the portfolio. So we uh, raised a lot of money, and uh, with the help of U.S. limited partners, bought the, uh, bought the fund. Can you help us understand that? Why is investing in the very best companies in the best industries with the brightest people in Canada not of interest to a bank that lends money out at 5%? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and you'd think that they should be interested in that, uh, except there was something in 2008 called financial crash. And uh, when that happened, uh, there was a lot of finger pointing going around and uh, I think at the end of the day the Obama administration, the SEC and all the regulators in the U.S. said the banks should not be in high risk businesses if they expect to be bailed out by the taxpayers. Uh, and the consequence of that is, is the Volcker Rule, or, or, or Dodd-Frank and the Volcker Rule specifically, which, which uh, effectively prevents banks from investing in high risk assets, uh, proprietary trading, private equity, and venture capital would, I mean, they can do it, but the capital charge is too late, so there's no economic return uh, in the form of, and the regulatory overhead of having to report in uh, is just makes it too difficult. And here we've been blaming, blaming the crash on derivatives and all those crazy mortgages all these years, and it was the VCs that brought it down. You know, it's, uh, it's an interesting argument. You can lose an unlimited amount of money on derivatives, but the most you can lose in venture capital is all of your money. You can't lose more than all of your money. <laughs> uh, but it's still classified as a high-risk business, and it's not an argument that uh, you know, you're going to be you're going to win against the regulators. We are an early-stage investor in two major categories. The first is enterprise software, and the second is fintech. And, and enterprise software for us is reasonably broadly defined. It's it's really it really starts with the data. It's, uh, um, it's all about the ingestion, the collection ingestion, uh, and analysis, analysis of the data. And that eventually creates information. And that information is then consumed by applications. And those applications are used by employees. Uh, and as, as they build the knowledge bases, they'll build insight that's eventually distributed throughout. Uh, so there's this, the element of that social enterprise. So it is all software, it's analytics, it's applications, it's a social enterprise, it's everything in between. Uh, the, the second category is FinTech, which is technology that is uh, targeted at financial services. It could be, it's financial services broadly defined. So you might think of it as banks, uh, but it's really banks, insurance companies, asset managers, capital market entities, it is payments, it's loyalty uh, programs, it's anything that really uh, deals with uh, monetary, any, any institution that deals with monetary assets. Uh, so technologies that help that. Uh, um, again, usually software based, not, not hardware based. And so, so basically you're, the two pillars that, that you're looking at investing in enterprise software and financial technology, FinTech, um, can you give us an example of each from your portfolio, either currently or recently? Yeah, or they could be hybrids, they could be both. Sure. Um, 
So just, just for clarity, people don't understand FinTech is a very big market. It's a, you know, there was about $6 billion of FinTech investment made worldwide uh, last year. And that's double from what it was two years ago, three billion two years ago. And I'd say about 60% of that is in the US. Uh, 60, 65, maybe two thirds of that is in the US. The rest, is, the rest of the world in Canada is a very small fraction. But, um, but to go back to your, to your uh, example, Verifin is a pure FinTech play. We do anti-money laundering fraud detection software for credit unions and community banks. When you think about banks, you think about Citi and JP Morgan and Royal Bank. Uh, you know, those are the top 50 banks in North America. There's 9,000 financial institutions, 9,000 banks or credit unions in, in North America. They all need technology. Uh, Verifin does anti-money laundering, fraud detection in the cloud as a SaaS service for those other banks. So Not the smaller the, banks? The smaller banks, yeah. So we'll serve, serve banks up to 20 billion, uh, but we'll go as low as 50 million. So banks with a single branch to a bank, uh, regional branch. Regional. So the famous national first national bank of Buffalo or something. The free, yeah, that's exactly it. That, that might even be you know a, a mid-sized bank to be honest with you, uh, because there has been consolidation to the extent there has been Canada. So that's a pure fintech play. There's another company called Adaptive Insight, which is a very it's an interesting play because it's a, it's a hybrid. It is budgeting, planning, uh, and forecasting software for the enterprise. So is that a FinTech play? Absolutely. Is it enterprise software? Absolutely. Uh, so, and, and then uh, Verisynth as an example was, was purely an enterprise software play. Incentive compensation management or sales performance management for enterprises. Most of them being global 2000 companies, but some mid-market uh, SMB companies as well. So yeah, and then got bought by IBM, so. Uh, which was an excellent exit for all, all involved, yes. Okay. Okay. And, and by the way, it has gone on to do wonderful things inside of IBM. Uh, so it's, an, it's a, an acquisition that has done very well with the infrastructure of IBM and the support and the, and the sales force of IBM. I understand that doesn't always happen when IBM buys company. It doesn't always That's happen uh, with, with many acquisitions, yes. yes absolutely. Yeah. Now, when we, when we talk about companies like this, I don't know, some people may find it Daunting. We've got a whole bunch of startup entrepreneurs here. Are the businesses that you're investing in are they are, are they the types that are being started by one, two, three person teams? You always start with one, two, three person team. But but they are more than you think, but not a lot. So I think we we did a, a bit of a, a survey in the, of the U.S. marketplace because we we also uh, do some investing in the U.S. Uh, but we also deal with U.S. LPs and so forth. Um, when we did the last survey, approximately 10% uh, of startups are, are enterprise, and 90% are uh, consumer uh, Interestingly enough, there are uh, uh, two enterprise exits, IPOs, for every consumer exit. Wow. <laughs> so uh, they're boring businesses, they take longer to build, they don't grow like at Uber-like rates, uh, and valuations, but they're solid businesses. And so if you can pick the right ones, there's a good chance that you can make something. Yeah. And as an entrepreneur, it's an area you should be thinking. And so to, thinking back to sort of the genesis of some of these organizations, is it something that two people can sit and say, you know, I've identified this need, or are the people there likely coming out of big enterprises where they've seen this this problem, this gap, this need for a solution. Yeah, it's it's probably it's it's more the latter, but it can be the former. Um, there's lots of management consultants who identify a need and decide, hey, we should go build a, a software company that services that. There's lots of people who come out of industry, and many come out of industry. More uh, there, and there's many that come from um, uh, adjacent software. So they've developed something for a particular market and identify the need for another vertical or another market and say, we can take what we've learned here and apply it there. And that, those, those make for good startups. Uh, it is difficult for, in our case, it's difficult for a 22-year-old university graduate to come out and say, hey, I'm going to solve this problem that GE has. Um, you probably need some experience inside an organization. You want to you have some exposure to the problems probably also want to understand how they buy. Um, and the buying behavior of Fortune 500 companies is very different than that of a consumer and also very different of small mid-sized businesses.
you're raising some money now. Tell us uh, what you're trying to raise it. We raised uh, we raised enough money to buy the fund. We've uh, now raised uh, over 50 million towards the new fund. Uh, we are hoping to have it close uh, sometime uh, in the summer. We are trying to find the remaining. Uh, gap between us and where we are in our, our first close target of 75 and we hope to get to about 125 million uh, when all is said and done. So overall I'm pretty comfortable or pretty confident that we're going to get there. It's going to be a few more months. So you're actually looking for funds the same as some of the people in this room are? Uh, you know, we are all looking for funds. <laughs> <laughs> There's a shortage of funds for some reason. <laughs> Uh, we're trying to solve your problem. We just need the pension funds to solve our problem. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and at, at that end of the of the ecosystem, because probably a lot of us don't hear much about that end. What what are what are you seeing? What are you hearing? You get, it sounds like it's a little tough getting this money out of uh, out of uh, out yeah. of your market. Uh, what are they saying? What are they looking at? What are they scared of? What are they excited about? They being the limited partners. The, our funders? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Pension uh, funds, other pension institutions. Fund. Yeah, so, you know, here's here's the bright spot. The Venture Capital Action Plan, VCAP program by the federal government, that's that's now in market, and uh, they are funding new new managers as well as existing managers. I think that'll trickle out over the next 12 to 24 months. majority of that will have been uh, um, allocated to uh, general partners. Uh, so that's great. Uh, it's it's not enough. So we we do rely on the corporate world. We do rely on family offices. Uh, there is a general apathy by the, by the pension community in Canada for this asset class. Um, and so what is I think the largest LP community in the U.S. is almost non-existent in Canada. Uh, we have owners who's trying to do it themselves, and that's a strategy, and, and it's worked effectively in private equity. I'm not sure it's going to work as well in venture capital, but you know, I wish them all luck. I think they they have been able to find good companies and been able to write big checks, so maybe that works. But the the remaining pension funds really haven't focused on. Um, CPP has put some money in with Northleaf, and I think PSP has put some money with the manager. But in general, if you go down the list of the 50 largest pension funds in Canada, um, they they don't see the need to be in this asset class. But part of it is is you know, uh, the performance of the asset class in Canada over the last 15 years has been great. We, in the late 90s, when a lot of money was made in the early 2000s, uh, we were on our first generation of venture funds. Uh, there were a couple of older ones, but really a first generation, and we made a lot of mistakes. We also had labor-sponsored funds making life very difficult, uh, chasing up valuations, uh, you know, uh, supporting, uh, frankly, startups that shouldn't have been. And so as an asset class, we didn't make a lot of money. I think that's behind us, uh, but the pension funds still need some time for us to move it. And is there, a, is there a pitch? I mean, is there a good argument to be made for the, these reluctant institutions to be in this asset class? Uh, it can make money. Uh, we are a top four top fund in North America. Uh, we are based here in Toronto. Uh, you can make money. If you know what you're doing, you can make money. There's a cycle. And there's a cycle in gold. There's a cycle in, in forest products. Uh, there's a cycle in technology. It's, and if you are with the, the asset class through the cycle, you, you should have a decent opportunity or, uh, or chance of making some money. Brent, Brent, I've run into so many entrepreneurs who say, you know, I had to talk to 50 potential funders, 50 angels, VCs, whatever, before I found someone to, to, help, to help my business. Um, what's, what's your ratio? How many people do you have to see in, 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 in those institutions? You know, how hard do you have to work? How, how, how skinned are your knees? Uh, look, it's been tough. It's, it's really been tough. Um, how hard do we have to work? We try to filter out the ones that we don't think we have a chance with very quickly. Um, there are a couple that we don't think we have a chance with that are big enough or have enough marquee value that we do continue to try. Um, but it's tough. There's a lot of no. Um, and even worse, there's a lot of no, no no's, no yes. There's just yeah. indifference. And you, you have to learn to read that as a no. Right. Uh, so that's, uh, and it's true of individuals and family offices and, and corporations, everybody we've gone to. We've knocked on a lot of doors. 
Uh, surprisingly, we have some U.S. interest and we have our lead order for this new fund is out of the U.S. Um, so, it's... Uh, Draw your own conclusions. Uh, well, you know, we also have Canadian institutional yeah. support, so... Uh, but, but as an entrepreneur, sometimes you have to go to unlikely un un uh, places and we, we're no different. We have, we have to go to where people like the story. And Maureen, are you here? Maureen? Maureen? Where's Maureen? Is there a Twitter handle for tonight? I didn't hear. Uh, uh, we can use uh, hashtag Startup Ryan T.O. So startup Ryan T.O. So I think a very tweetable moment was uh, where Robert said that you get that there are yeses, there are noes, and there are those no answers, which you've really got to learn to read as a no. I think that's good <laughs> advice for everybody. What's the best way to contact a guy like you? What's the best way to pitch you? Uh, the, the best way is still a warm introduction. Uh, there's the, the number of deals we see even though we historically haven't been active, and when we were active, they, it's just astronomical. So the, the hit rate is still around 1%. Uh, in fact, in our historically, we've been probably less than 1%. So uh, there's a lot coming in, and I think what you need to do is focus on uh, finding a into a venture fund that has alignment with what you're doing. So there is no point in going after fund ABC if they're a silicon investor and you and you've got a mobile payments company. Uh, but if there's if they're mobile focused or payments focused, hey, you can do the research. You can find the funds that are active in, in those uh, uh, various categories. You can do the portfolio search to, to understand whether or not they've invested in what you think is a competitor. And, and if they have, or even if they, if they have, haven't, that's great. If they have, you may still want to approach them. Um, and a warm introduction is great. So look at their advisory board, look at the boards they're on, look at who they've used as legal counsel, uh, look, look at where they, uh, they shop. Um, you know, find, find somebody who has an in to the organization. Uh, and that's very powerful because it is one way of filtering. It is only one way, but it we will lend that, that we will give it slightly more credibility to something that's warm. We will get a lot of credibility to something that's hot. A, a previous CEO that we worked with, a co-investor we made a lot of money in, who's showing us something, um, a source that has been very good for us. We, you know, those are hot leads. Cold lead. Cold lead is is you know just off, over the trends. Um, and how you turn yourself from a cold to a warm is also within your within your control. If you think you're raising money 12 front months from now, it's, there is at least in our organization there is no harm in coming in to see us 12 months before you need the money. We will then watch. We will have at least a baseline from which we can we can assess it. And if you say you're going to do this over the next six and next 12 months and before you go to raise money, and you come back to us six months later or 12 months later and say, I did exactly what I said I was going to do, the credibility factor goes up dramatically. That's now war. Uh, you weren't introduced by anybody. You managed to come into one of our office hours. You managed to see us uh, somewhere and spend a few minutes with us. And that, that's one. That's a great way of doing it. Uh, we're doing the same in our fundings. You know, we're now talking to people that we want in our next fund because we, we know they're not going to be in this one. Uh, and we're just going to make sure that on a periodic basis they get updates and they, they understand that we do exactly what we say. You know, we try at least and hopefully meet or exceed. What do you see being the outlook for venture capital here? And, as Michael would say, is there reason for founders to hope? Yeah, I'll be enough hope is something you can't take away. You can take away a lot of things, but you can never take away hope. Uh, but okay, absolutely, there's hope. Uh, I, I, uh, there, were, there have been dark days, and there have been better days, and uh, certainly the industry is healthier in the U.S. than it is here in Canada, but there certainly is hope. I think that money from the VCAP program is, is finding its way into uh, the right hands in Canada. I think there's a lot of interest in the Canadian venture community by U.S. LPs, uh, U.S. Uh, GPs, rather, investors, and we're seeing that. 
Uh, our companies have raised over $100 million, our Canadian companies have raised over $100 million from the US uh, VCs. They get interested in good concepts. Um, there's, there, there, there are more, it's more difficult to find good companies at reasonable valuations in the US, so I think uh, they're finding their way up here at all stages. Uh, more so in the later, latter stages than the early stages, but they're finding their way up. And so I think there is lots of reasons to be, to be uh, uh, optimistic. The public markets have also helped. And when you think about what our cycles are, our cycles are really dependent on the public cycles. So if there is no IPO activity, no M&A activity, no exits, we are stuck on, uh, with money that we can't return to the LPs and the LPs get frustrated. So as long as there's a, a, a vibrant and healthy public market, I think, I think there is hope, and the U.S. markets, are, I think, are, are frankly have more upside than the Canadian markets. The U.S. Re consumers rebounding, uh, you know, they, there's a, uh, there's lots of um, positive uh, economic momentum in the U.S. much more than it is there is here. So that's going to stay healthy. If that stays healthy, there's going to be exit activity. There's going to be investing activity. Or funds are going to get created, uh, and it's, that money is going to find its way here as well. So the Canadian aspect with is 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 here. I think next, as I said earlier, next uh, 12 to 24 months, we'll see a lot of that money in the Canadian marketplace. U.S. money can work its way up here. Right? And you, you've been close to a number of companies that you've invested in. You've been on the boards of many of them. Um, just wondering what you've seen there. What are the, the best practices of entrepreneurs who are trying to build growth companies in you know the technology spaces you've discussed? In, in Canada, what are the things that they've done right that you think more entrepreneurs should aspire to do? Uh, I think uh, they've built great teams and they've built great culture. Uh, I, I have, I've been at this now for 17 years and even the last five years I have marveled at how important culture is. Uh, and culture is different in each company but it has to be healthy and it has to be vibrant and that means Good people dedicated to the cause, working, debating, having that debate, picking a direction, uh, and, and following it, and working extremely hard to get there, uh, making it fun, and making that process fun, a, uh, that's all important, and then eventually giving back. So giving back uh, is, is part of that. And good culture is a retention mechanism. Good culture is a, um, is a, uh, uh, I forget the word now, but it, it's something that drives people. And people, if you are energized by it, you want to go to work, you work a hell of a lot harder. Uh, and you do have to work hard today. Nothing is easy. It's global. Um, what, what are some of the other things that characterize a great culture in Canada? I mean, I mean, if we were asked to think of companies with great cultures, we probably tend to think of Zappos and, and, and some of the legendary companies in the States. What do we got here? T teamwork. Teamwork is important. Listening to the employees, uh, making this a family as much as a company, it's incredibly important in the early stages, uh, but it can hold it until you're several hundred employees strong. Uh, I think that that's, that's important, uh, having a common cause, getting people to give, provide feedback, having a voice, uh, and everybody in the team wants a voice. At the end of the day, it is the management team's responsibility to, to, to uh, pick the direction of the company, and it's ultimately the CEO's responsibility to make sure that everything gets there, but people have, you can have a, a input and have a say. Uh, uh, I think uh, teamwork, you know, um, I, I, I love uh, scrums. I think scrums should be used by all departments on a daily basis, not just the developers. So I what's a scrum? A scrum is where you just get together early, first thing in the morning, and parcel out what, what needs to get done that day, uh, what the priorities are and what they need to work on. That's, that's great. Uh, they, they work effectively, exceedingly well, when it's done right. Uh, because there's always, if you're not being um, evaluated every 365 days, you're being evaluated every 24 hours. We, you find the weaknesses in the team very quickly. You find who the contributors are. You find who the leaders can be, that next generation of leaders. Uh, that's important to growing a company, and you don't always want to hire from outside. You want to grow 
those from within if you can. So those are the, the those are things that come out of scrum rules, and uh, you, you, you know they're very powerful. So what, what what are some of the uh, mistakes that you see that sort of get made maybe maybe repetitively over and over again by different companies? What are the things that bring uh, these growth companies down that you think our group should know about? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, lack of transparency is one, and it's lack of transparency with us, the investor, or the board. But it's also lack of transparency internal. Uh, we can't solve problems we don't know. About. We can't help. Employees, your co your teammates can't do it either. So uh, there's people who believe that bad news should be withheld. Well, actually, bad news bad news is a challenge. It's a, something to overcome. Uh, you may have lost a client. Understand. Go back. Look at it. Be honest with yourself. Understand. Doing a proper assessment to understand what went wrong. Be self-critical. Accept the criticism. Um, do something about it. I think so. That that transparency is is a, is incredibly important. Uh, we we also find that uh, as oftentimes entrepreneurs have blinders. They they say, well, you know, our competi competition isn't like us. Um, you know what, it really doesn't matter what you think. It, it's the market that determines whether or not uh, you're going to be successful. And, and, and if the market thinks you're a competitor, even if you don't think it is, you are, you are. And so you need to understand who you're selling against, um, what their value proposition is, and how you're better than that value proposition. Lots of people who are in denial about somebody else. And, 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 and it's... And it may be, it might have been true at one time, but there's so much convergence going on, you know? It's companies that, uh, that have targeted the, the, the mid-market now are moving up to the enterprise, likewise down. Somebody who was in one vertical has now moved over to the second vertical. Uh, that happens commonly, uh, frequently. So it's, even if it wasn't true at one time, it might be true today. So, okay. Do we have any questions from the audience? I've got a bunch, but okay, we do have one. Let's start with here and we'll work our way back. So. Tell us your question. You can stand up and introduce yourself. Tell us your question, and I'll repeat it to make sure everyone can hear it. So, uh, I would like to know uh, how Information VP decide to involve themselves into the management process of the company you decide to invest with. Uh, what constitutes for you like an ideal situation? Is it more hands off or quarterly reports or it's really engaging, monthly, or even weekly uh, management? Okay. I have a very short memory span, so the question was, how does Information Venture Partners decide whether or not or how to get involved with the management of the companies they invest in? Okay. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum, there's, there's several variables. First is the experience of the management team itself that determines how much we need to get involved. The agent stage of the company determines how, how we need to get involved. An early stage company needs our help a lot more than a company that is uh, matured now as seasoned executives and seasoned management teams. Um, but philosophically, we don't manage companies. We, that's not our job. Um, we are there to help managers, but we are very active in that process. So we get involved and we challenge management teams on a lot of things. Sales process is one that we spend a lot of time on. Understanding your sales process, because the one going back to a, a, a question you had, common mistakes. Common mistake we make is not understanding the sales process of you, our portfolio company, when we make the investment. So we spend a lot of time before the investment. We spend a lot of time after the investment, making sure we you understand it, we understand it, we refine it. And it is surprising how how under. Uh, how people don't spend enough time on that. Um, so we challenge you on that process. We challenge you on the efficiency of that process from lead to sale. We challenge you on your pricing strategy, your go-to-market strategy, your channels, your partners. That's our job, is to challenge you. Uh, yeah, we get quarterly financial statements, um, but and I don't know how frequently board meetings are. At the very early stages, it's probably monthly. At the latter stages, it's probably quarterly. But we are, we are not people who go from board meeting to board meeting. We go from board meeting to phone call to meeting to two more phone calls to an introduction to a channel partner to a customer back to another board meeting. Uh, and that's our, that's our role. And we are here to help. We are there to bounce ideas off. We have seen 
what you're going through probably more than you have. Doesn't mean we have the answer, nor does it mean that when we have an answer, it's the right answer. We also acknowledge that. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, you know, we, we are there as a resource and you should use it uh, because we have, we have seen it uh, quite frequently. We love getting involved in, in people decisions. Uh, so any senior executives, uh, we like to be involved in that hiring process. Uh, it's important to get the right people in the right spots at the right times. And if you haven't done it before, um, you, you, you're more likely to make a mistake. You're not, I'm not saying you're going to make a mistake, but you're more likely. So that's one, one area that we spend a fair amount of time with. And that's also at the board level, making sure we bring in the right board members to companies because each one is expected to contribute in their own way to the success of the startup. To what extent would you, might you consider a crowdfunding platform to be a competitor? No, I, I actually think it's, frankly, it's, it's probably more deal flow for us than a competitor. You, yeah, you can probably raise five million or twenty million, um, but I think what's more apt to happen is that you're going to raise half a million to a million with your with with it. Um, you as a, as a startup, you will probably make some progress. You'll hit some milestones, and then you'll think about what the alternatives are. You may go back to the portal, the platform, to raise your next five million, but you might also, also come to me or some of the other things and say, "Hey, here's what I want." When you talk about culture. Talk a bit about what you see as best practices in owners allocating equity out to people on their teams. And you know, where do you see that working? Where do you not see it working in terms of motivating success in the business? Eric, there's no one right answer there. Um, equity has value and it should be treated as such. And not everybody believes it has value because not everybody has seen the value that it can be created from being an owner in a business. So the things, one of the things we do with all of our portfolio companies is we want to establish that philosophical, the, the, the philosophical um, uh, strategy that, that uh, around options and equity ownership. We are proponents of having broad equity ownership all the way down to the lowest level staff member. Um, but if that, if the value of that equity is not recognized then it's a waste. And that should be concentrated on the people who actually do see value in it. Because it's meant to be an incentive. It's meant for you to work, to, to believe in that company, to take ownership and make decisions like an owner. Um, and so if that if it doesn't achieve the objective, then having everybody in the company be an option holder is not the right answer. Then you have to pick where, where it does make sense. Silicon Valley is clearly everybody, and it has been everybody for the last 20, 25 years. It's not true of secondary markets. Um, we have companies in places like Atlanta uh, that, that don't see it the same way. We have companies in Chicago that even there, they don't quite see it the same way. And Toronto is, is a secondary market. Uh, I encourage it. I'd like to see it. It's very valuable. Uh, it is, it has, Tremendous amount of upside, uh, but if the employees themselves don't see it that way, then think think very long and hard about how you distribute them. Uh, but we, we certainly encourage it. It's, it's got value to everybody. There are Sandy Hershaw. You work for the Canadian banks. Um, what's the likelihood of the Canadian banks actually buying out a Toronto-based fintech or Canadian-based fintech company? I understand there's a lot of developers and teams who work for the banks working on their own fintech internal applications. I mean, you kind of put the Canadian environment here. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question, and, and, and you're just going to get an opinion. I, I can't give you fact. Um, I think the Canadian banks, for the most part, believe they can build things, and so they don't have to buy them. Um, I, I think that's, that's been the case historically. I think it's the case today. I have seen no activity or uh, action or acquisitions that would suggest otherwise. However, there have been what, three, four CEO changes in the last 12 months in the Canadian banks, and the, the mantra of many of the new CEOs is innovation. Um, and I believe that they are trying to empower their organizations to be innovative, which means now, believe it or not, making small investments in startups, working with the startup community, building internal labs. But I also believe that somehow, somewhere out of this will be acquisitions. 
that they're going to find technologies that they would like to own for the Canadian market, own for their broader uh, markets, Canadian, North American, whatever it might be, uh, or just think that they're proprietary and want to want to uh, develop it and you know continue to, to own it in house as a differentiator. So I think it's coming. I just haven't seen it uh, today. How would somebody get a warm introduction to someone? Find the different connection points that you have between uh, me and you. And that could be a neighbor, it could be a lawyer we've used in the past, it could be a former entrepreneur, it could be a former board member. It is a common connection point. It could be two degrees removed. Uh, getting more than two degrees removed is tough. Uh, so an introduction to somebody who knows somebody who knows me, that's about as far as you can take. Uh, I don't think it, it works beyond that, and then it's the quality of the linkages between. Uh, but it, it's not, you know, we, I think we, we generally are pretty easy to find. You know, we work a lot in Mars. There's got to be somebody you know at Mars that knows me. Uh, you know, I, I just think there's a little bit of elbow grease and you, you can find that individual. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing particularly with Upside and, and, and why you're doing it. Yeah, so how many people are aware of what the Upside Foundation is? Uh, there's a few people, that's great. Okay, the Upside Foundation is really a foundation of charity geared towards the startup community. And what we're trying to do is bring corporate social responsibility to that community. When you think about charities, you think of two things. You think that they either want your money or your time. So whether they want to check for some campaign or they want you to clean up a beach or a park, whatever it is, or volunteer some hours, people want time and money. Uh, a startup, you don't have time and you don't have money. But what you do have is potential. And what we'd like to do is see the entrepreneurial community share that potential, share the upside, hence the name of the Upside Foundation. So what we are seeking in the Upside Foundation is 1% or up to 1% of a startup in options. And, and when there is a liquidity event, Though that, those, that money, the monetization of those options, go back to the community, to charities if you want to support them. And we have done all the legwork to create that platform with the Canadian government to get the charitable status. It's something that takes years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now we've got it down to a three-page agreement. And the, the objective is to make this a best practice. There are numerous organizations around the world. Uh, Pledge 1% is the most recent in the U.S. Founders... Uh, Founders Circle, I think it is, no, it's not Founders Circle, it's Founders something else, the, uh, the Entrepreneurs Foundation, Tamora, uh, Tamora's Israeli-based, it's raised 15 million or so for charity, Entrepreneurs Foundation uh, out of California has raised even more for charity, uh, and it makes no difference to the entrepreneur. Whether you own 99% or 100% of the company, it doesn't make a difference. When you walk away with 20 million or 19.5 million, it doesn't make a difference. Um, but every dollar counts. These charities, there's not enough charitable activity, not enough capital for the charities that we need to support in this country. And it's an easy way for, for you to give back. You can also build your culture around it. So pick something that you or the team likes. Uh, you get to meet great CEOs uh, of other startups. You get the great events. We're this fall hopefully hosting a VC night where all the startups can come in and, and meet all the VCs in the Toronto community um, uh, and get access to them that way. We do, we do things at CIX, we have special dinners and events, and, and, uh, and so there's, you do get things back, but it's really about you and your willingness to, to give back. And this generation of entrepreneurs, it's important to them. I'm, 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 I'm old. In the big scheme of things, I'm old. Uh, and we weren't raised that way. We, we, it wasn't about recycling and giving back and volunteer hours. We just, that was the way we were brought up. It was within the family unit, but not in school. And, and, and not so, in business. And not in business. But that's what we want to do. Is we want to change the way the startup community thinks about giving back. And we've made it as easy as, as it possibly can be to do that. Can you give us an update on where you're at? Have you got a number of people who have already committed? To, yeah. And we, has there been any uh, we've had, income to There it? has been. Uh, we, we started uh, taking donations uh, tw uh, late 2013 or so. Um, we have about uh, three dozen uh, companies on the platform. We've had one exit. Uh, that exit wasn't very big, but it was thousands of dollars to two charities in the Toronto area. 
Um, we have uh, numerous great companies, including some of our portfolio companies that, uh, that, uh, that have donated. We also have representation in eastern Canada through Jerry Pond, uh, Montreal, the West Coast. We have uh, Zifkin, ben, ben Zifkin, and Hubbard, the first entrepreneur involved, was on the board. And it's, 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 a great, uh, it's a great cause. The majority of our investing, uh, almost all of our investing, happens at around a million of revenue. Uh, one to two million of revenue. It's a, it's a, it, we are, it's a good spot. I think you, as an entrepreneur, can probably get there through angel financings and other means. Um, although, and I'll come back to the fact that we have done pre revenue, but it's enough information for us to make it an assessment of, of the opportunity. So that means there is a product. It is not a mature product. It is not a completely built out product. The team is not completely in place. Um, the strategy is probably hit and miss. Uh, so there's still a lot of holes and still a lot of things we can help you with, but at least there's enough information for us to make an assessment on the product, the market size, pricing, the team, and the things that are important to us, competitors, exits, and things like that. We do take, uh, we, do, we do invest pre-revenue. Uh, <laughs> I think out of this new fund we'll make 15 investments, maybe 16, something around, that's our target, 15, 16. We'll, we'll probably do less than a handful of pre-revenue companies. They take a lot more effort. Um, to, they all take a lot of effort, but they take a lot more effort because nothing is in place. Um, I've even stepped into uh, one investment where we did the pre revenue rise of CEO uh, just to get it off the ground and make sure that it was off in the right direction. Um, and I'm prepared to do that. It's not what I want to do, but if I like it enough, that's, that's something that, that I would do. Uh, that's, in, in Canada, we have well over 100 incubators and accelerators, which is really taking care of the really early stage stuff. Uh, we have access to U.S. capital for later stage stuff. We don't have enough Series A, Series B investors. And I think that's what we're trying to cover, is that, that Series A, the first institutional round. Maybe we follow a, a real, which does a seat, and they're an institution. You know, they'll do, do something with the revenue. But that's, that's kind of the way we differentiate ourselves. And we're certainly the only ones who do it in the two areas that we do it with, with the experience. That we have. One of the areas that's been of great interest is this new cluster that Mars is working on. What's your plans for your group, since you're all focused on fintech, in working with the Mars cluster? Yes. So I think we're, we're part of that cluster, certainly the fintech. They're going to build several clusters, but fintech is the one that we've been asked to participate in, and I think it's going to be a great partnership. Um, I, you know, our, our job, well, we're, our job is to make, find great entrepreneurs, make great investments, make money for our limited partners. Our job is also to build the Canadian ecosystem. And we can be helpful to Mars, we can help be, be, help, be helpful to the people that they, they work with in their businesses. And I think that's our commitment. Our commitment is to be there to help them make their company successful. And as they are ready for investors, we certainly want to be there to, to have a lot. Uh, but working with Mars gives us an early one. Um, and that, that sometimes means opening up our networks, but it also means giving us, giving them the benefit of our experience, insight and, and feedback on what they're doing, um, uh, what we think we, they probably are doing well, or, or what they need to work on. Happy to work on uh, with Mars and Adam uh, in, in, in that uh, respect. Uh, FinTech, there is no reason FinTech there's no reason enterprise can't be there. In, in, in Toronto, there's also certainly no reason FinTech can't be. This is a very large financial center by global standards, uh, not by domestic standards, by far the largest by domestic standards, by, by global standards, large and well-respected. And there is no reason a bank can't buy technology that was developed by a Toronto software company, or, or one in Delhi, or one in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this, is, this is a strength of this country. Um, we should take advantage of it, um, and you know we have the education, we have the know-how, we have the developers, we have the entrepreneurs. Let's make it successful. Buzz, what's your advice for a young entrepreneur who wants to gain insight into some of the problems facing enterprises in order to try and develop some solutions? Do they have to do? Do they have to go inside and undercover to, to learn about those, or can they do it from the outside? Uh, they can do both. Uh, I, I don't think because you're young doesn't mean you're going to come up with the idea that you can't find it. 
you still can. It's just more difficult not having seen Ben on the inside. So I think if you have an idea as a young entrepreneur, get it validated by people in the business who see that problem, who can identify with that problem, and surround yourself with people who, who can help you get into those organizations. Uh, so that may mean going into an organization, but it just may mean surrounding yourself with people who, who, who see the same value in what you've developed. Um, and make sure they're the right people. And so they could be co-founders, they could be employees, they could be advisors, they could be board members, whatever it is, there's many ways to skin that cat to make sure you're working with people who can validate, validate the issue. Um, uh, and get a customer. The easiest way to validate it is to get a customer. So get find, you can either find a job in those organizations and then convince them to do it, <coughs> Or you can just find an organization that's open to, to, to being uh, uh, working with an entrepreneur. Listen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Robert, for uh, spending so much time with us and talking about the, the, the stuff that, that you've seen and sharing a lot of, uh, I think, really good wisdom and information for the founders in the room. Murray, do you want to do you have any announcements or anything to close things off officially? Thanks, Rick. Um, no, I don't uh, have any specific announcements. You heard what I said this morning. Earlier, uh, one thing that Michael really is keen on uh, after we break up is uh, it's all about inspiration and education. So I think we've all learned a lot. I learned a lot today, so I really appreciate that. That's certainly inspiring to hear from Robert and Bridget. Um, so the upper is connecting. So we have more drinks, a little more pizza here. I would really encourage everyone to hang around a little longer and connect and get a business card. And uh, move forward from that. So, thank you very much. And I, Our, I encourage all you entrepreneurs. I, I think it's, I think the world of entrepreneurs. I, I, I think it's, it's wonderful that you are interested, that you're going to do this, that you want to do this. Uh, uh, it's only great for for yourself. I think you learn, you become a better human being for doing it. But it's also great for the country and great for this region. So, uh, and, and Vietnam, I was there 14 months ago. It's, it's emerging. It's, uh, it's really coming on strong. I, I think. Uh, so, you know, your competition isn't just Silicon Valley, it's places like that. But you can do it. And I, I think this is a great time to be here. And does anyone in the audience have any announcements of other things that are happening in the community that they want to share? No? Upsidefoundation.ca. Go take a look. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll put that up on the screen uh, after we adjourn. So thank you, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again.